Okay, good morning, everybody. And um, uh, this morning, uh, we're going to be uh, discussing, starting a discussion. I, am, I think we'll move through it as quickly as possible on um, osmoregulation and excretion. Tremendously important uh, physiological activities as for all sorts of reasons, as we'll hear. This is not just a matter um, of our kidneys getting rid of waste in the form of urine. The, this becomes involved with all sorts of homeostatic mechanisms, maintaining pH, maintaining blood pressure, for sure getting rid of, of, of excretory waste. But many, many different physiological systems are tied in to the regulation of osmoregulation, especially. Um, and we'll have extensive discussion, especially about the functioning of our kidneys uh, in doing so. so uh, just let me check one thing, please. Yes, okay. Um, so the first uh, first thing to realize um, is that although many animals have moved up onto land, like us, like we ourselves, um, we are in fact aquatic animals in many ways, in that all of our cells, in order to function, they are bathed in fluid and most of their content is in fact water. And that is because all of our biochemical reactions that make up our metabolism um, actually take place in solution. So whether or not uh, we, we're talking about aquatic animals, which are surrounded by water, which may itself differ in its composition, or we're talking about terrestrial animals, um, which carry their own aquatic environment around with them. We all function in an aquatic environment. And the balance between that the, the water itself and our solutes, the concentrations of water and the concentrations of solutes needs to be maintained within very narrow limits. Um, and for reasons that will become clear as we discuss this. And the maintenance of that balance is an active process. The or organisms are always regulating the balance of salts in their interstitial fluids and in their cells and everything else. They actively do it. And that is termed osmoregulation. Osmoregulation regulates solute concentrations. And by doing so, it, it governs the movement of water from one place to another, especially across cell membranes, for example. Um, so there, animals in, inhabit a huge variety of different habitats, and each of them has their own uh, osmoregulatory demands. Probably one of the harshest <clears throat> of all environments, believe it or not, um, is that of fresh water. Uh, fresh water uh, animals essentially are drowning the whole time. Why? Because they're in an environment, they live in an environment <clears throat> where the surrounding uh, medium has much lower solute concentrations, far lower salt concentrations, etc., molecule concentrations, solute concentrations, than either the interstitial fluids or the cell cytoplasm itself. As a result, in freshwater environments, water is continually flooding in to the, to the organism, whether it's a small protozoan, single cell, or multicellular, like a fish or whatever. They have battled this problem the whole time. Water floods into them to try and, by, to try and dilute the high concentration of solutes in their flesh. On the other hand, desert animals, and there are many of them, and mar marine animals as well, they face the opposite problem. Well, terrestrial animals in general face this problem, but it's particularly marked in deserts, but it's also very marked in seawater environments. And that is that these organisms tend to lose water continuously. Desert animals, terrestrial animals, obviously, because water evaporates. Um, and for other reasons as well. 
where, for example, we need to get rid of nitrogenous waste, which must be dissolved in water. We have to void a certain amount of water continuously. Marine animals, their surrounding medium, the solute concentration is much higher than their cells. So water tends to flood out of their cells to try and dilute the environment around them. Marine animals desiccate. They dry out unless they have a way of continuously acquiring more water. And we'll see that, how they do this. At the same time, as I've mentioned, excretory products need to be dissolved in water. So there is a, there's at least one place where all organisms now have got to lose water, deliberately lose water. So this water balance is critically important to the homeostasis of organisms. Um, when we'll, we're going to talk extensively about this topic, osmoregulation. And osmoregulation we're going to find is very largely dependent on <clears throat> cells being able to actively control the solutes in the cytoplasm. So they actively move solutes into and out of cytoplasm in, and water, the water follows passively. Um, uh, the movement of water is controlled passively by controlling the concentrations of solutes. So let's just have, have a look, a simple, uh, a simple experiment, a simple example, um, but this leads us into discussions about the structure of the cell and how a cell functions. So here's the setup. We have a beaker of beaker and the beaker is divided by a membrane. This membrane has a special property and that is it will allow the passage of water, the free passage of water molecules, but it will not allow the passage of ions, of solutes. And because of that, we call it a semi-permeable membrane. And that is typical, for example, of our cell membranes and of the membranes of, um, of organelles and things like that. They are semi-permeable. They allow the free passage of water, but they are able to control the passage of solute. So in our setup here, <clears throat> it's really simple. We've got a high concentration of solutes on this side and we have a low concentration of solutes on that side. But this situation is not a simple one because what you need to remember is that the ions that make up the solute um, are kept separate from one another because they have shells of water molecules around them. We call them hydration shells. If you don't remember, go back because we discussed it in the first semester of biology, in the basic chemistry and everything of, of life. Um, ions are kept apart from one another in solution because they're covered with water molecules. That is bound, that is water of hydration, and it's not gonna feature in our thinking. Okay, so here we have lots of, of ions, each with the hydration shells around them. And in between them, they have, there is free water. And they, this is what this means here, free H2O. Free H2O is water which is free, which is not bound to ions as hydration shells. So if we look at this, we, there's two ways to think about it. First of all, we have a high concentration of solutes of ions, this side, low concentration of ions, that side. But we're not, we're going to remember one thing, the forces of diffusion move substances from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. This, we've got high concentration solutes here, they can't move. Why? Because it's a semi-permeable membrane. What about the water though? The water can move and what is the concentration of water? Well, the concentration of water on this side of free water, water not associated with ions, the concentration of water on this side is very much higher. So the water high here on this side, the concentration of water is very much lower 
water is going to move from this area to this area. It's going to start moving across the, the membrane. That's, um, that movement is really important because just in, we're going to see, put ourselves into a situation in a minute where this is an actual, actual cell. And this is a pressure which, which occurs in real life in cells. So uh, when just get some, some terms clear. The concentration of solutes is referred to as the osmolarity of the solution of has an osmolarity, which is determined by the concentration of solutes in it. A uh, concentration, a solution with a high number of solutes has a high osmolarity. With low, it has low osmolarity. Where this uh, side here, is referred to being as being hypo below hypo osmotic to this side. This side here is hyper osmotic to that side. And what free water will move from an area of hypo osmolarity to an area of hyper osmolarity. So the water is going to move that way. And remember, it does so because the concentration of water molecules, free water molecules, is high there and low there. It's a really important concept to get into your mind that the movement, this movement of water is a diffusive process. It has, in the case of, of water, we use a special name. We say it is osmosis. Osmosis refers specifically to the diffusion of water molecules. So these are the important implications in real life. And um, uh, let's just um, think, for example, about a cell. We're going to just take, uh, we can think of any cell. Um, this is classically in lab. <clears throat> this is done with red blood cells, but it can be any cell because cell membranes are semi-permeable. So, and um, uh, we're going to dump this cell um, into uh, fresh water into low solute concentration. In this case, the inside of the cell is hyperosmotic. Remember back here. Oops. Remember back here. This is the inside of the cell. It is hyperosmotic to its surroundings. <clears throat> what is going to happen, just as in our little experiment, water is going to flood in to the cell. If that is not controlled in some way, then the cell is going to swell and swell and swell and ultimately it'll burst. So this is exactly what happens if you take red blood cells, for example, and you drop them into, into fresh water almost instantly, water floods in, they swell up and they burst. Very, very dangerous situation. And cells which live in low solute environments, in hypoosmotic environments, have to have very active mechanisms to control the flow of water. They very often actively pump the water out. Um, if you think back, you remember when we talked about invertebrates and we talked about protozoa, we saw those protozoa with contractile vacuoles that pump the whole time. That is what they're doing. They're pumping water out to maintain their osmotic environment. So uh, I'm just going to jump to this side. Because here, if, if we take our, our red blood cell and we drop it into a, a solution of a high concentration of salts, for example, now the, the cell, in, the inside of the cell is hypoosmotic. Where does water flow? It flows from hypo to hyper, right? From high water concentration to low water concentration. The cell is going to shrivel up. Like, and you can, you can visibly see this happen. The net flow is out of the cell. Many organisms try to maintain an internal environment where the interstitial fluids and everything that bathes the cells are ice osmotic. The concentration of solutes is the same inside the cell as it is outside the cell. 
And this is called an ice osmotic situation. Inside is the same as the outside. But there's something very important to explain about this. This does not mean that there is no movement of, of, of water. There is no movement of ions because this is a semi-permeable membrane. Any movement of ions is because the cell chooses to do so and actively pumps them one way or another. The movement of water is passive. In an isosmotic situation, let's just think, if we have a water molecule here, one water molecule that makes its way across the membrane, boink, onto that side. What have we done? We've made this side infinitely hypoosmotic. And what will happen? One molecule will go that way to restore the isosmotic condition. So in the isosmotic condition, it's not that water movement stops, it doesn't, it carries on. But for every molecule that moves across, one moves the other way. So there's movement back and can be movement back and forth, but as much goes one way, moves the other way. Okay, so um, we're going to see um, organisms placed into uh, different kinds of environments. Oh, we're going to take some of our organisms, we're going to put them into fresh water, very, very challenging environment. Uh, we're going to take some of our organisms, put them into salt water. Uh, we're going to take some organisms and look, see what happens when they come up on land. Um, there um, are different strategies that an organism can, can adopt. First of all, there are some organisms which are osmoconformers, and that is, um, they don't they they don't do anything to regulate their their uh, osmolarity. They um, they just live in an environment, and whatever the environment solute concentrations etc. That is what they their their cells are, and it's just essentially they let they let the environment determine their osmolarity. Um, this is not a common. Uh, strategy, but there are organisms, marine organisms, which do this. Um, thing, simple things like sponges, cnidarians, these sort of things are osmoconformers. It puts a tremendous limit on them, though, because um, they actually it limits the environment that they can, they can live in. They cannot withstand any major changes in osmolarity. Most organisms are osmoregulators. They carefully monitor the concentration of solutes in, the, in their cells and in their interstitial fluids, and they regulate it. They actively regulate it in some way. So they osmoregulators, they actually have to expend energy to do so. So what they, what they, they do is they're controlling the water uptake, but they're also controlling the solute concentrations. And that, that is an active process, which requires energy. They can only, most organisms can only do this within very strict limits. Um, they can live sometimes in, in what appear to be very harsh environments with very high environmental solute concentrations, etc. That does happen. But most organisms, we refer to them as being stenohaline. They cannot withstand rapid or wide changes in the osmolarity, in the external osmolarity. They, may, they are adapted for particular uh, environmental osmolarities. And they, <clears throat> it's very difficult to regulate outside of those osmolarities. There are a few organisms which we refer to as being urihaline, and they can withstand large fluctuations in external osmolarity. And I'll give you one spectacular example. Um, and that is if you think of a fish like salmon, um, there, there are fish which will mature in salt water, for example, and then move into fresh water. They move into fresh water to 
reproduce salmon do. There are other fish like eels, which move into fresh water to mature and live many years in fresh water, then go back to the ocean to go and reproduce. They're withstanding wide fluctuations in osmolarity, in external osmolarity. We call them Uri haline. So they are they're able to withstand these. There are some environments you'll realize where organisms have to be Uri haline. For example, in an estuary where a river meets the sea, where they've got tides coming in and out of the estuary and the salinity varies widely, you'd expect animals there to be Uri haline. In most environments, the um, organisms are steno haline. Let's have a look um, at some of the different strategies that um, organisms have to adopt. We take two fishes um, and uh, we'll have one marine <clears throat> and one fresh water. It is very difficult to conceive of how different these environments actually are. They sound like they're the sim similar kind of environment. They're not, they're not at all. They are radically different to one another. So let's have a look at the, the marine fish. Remember, a marine fish is living in an environment where its surroundings there are hyperosmotic to the organism itself. In other words, there's a much higher solute concentration around than inside the, the, the cells. And what is going to happen? Water is going to move from the organism out continuously. And so the, the, the marine fish have to adopt strategies to continually recover water, to continually gain water. So first of all, they're at a disadvantage um, because uh, they respire through gills. The, the gills are an extensive surface area um, across which exchange of gases has to occur. But those are also surfaces across which many, many solute ions could be lost. Um, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, many, many water molecules could be lost. So, and this is exactly, exactly what happens. Water moves out continuously out of the gills um, and begins, the fish is actually being dehydrated continuously. So the, the first thing um, that happens that uh, the, uh, the fish has to drink continuously. So marine fish drink continuously. And what they do is, they actually excrete the salt ions from, the, they have special cells which excrete salt so that they, what they're gaining is the water, is the water are the water molecules. So they're drinking continuously, they excrete the salt ions and use the water to try and maintain their internal environment. They also have highly adapted kidneys um, and the kidneys uh, excrete many of the, the solutes that they're taking in, the salt especially, with a very small amount of water, the small amount, uh, an amount of water as possible. So marine fish, they conserve water in every way, in every way possible. At the same time, they get it, they're gaining water from their, their food and everything else. So that's one environment, but believe it or not, this marine, the marine environment is relatively benign compared to the freshwater. Freshwater organisms live in, actually in a very harsh environment. And that is because the, their cells are hyperosmotic to their environment. So now what is, go, what is going to happen is water is going to continuously flood in to the cells. And these organisms have to be voiding water as fast as possible. This is a very rapid process. So they are voiding water as rapidly as possible. And the, the reason that the environment is so harsh is because their solutes are continually being diluted. They have to work really hard to conserve all their solutes and at the same time get rid of as much water as, as they possibly can. So what they, uh, what they 
are going to do is, first of all, their kidneys are designed to avoid very, very large quantities of dilute urine. Again, the gills is a major area um, where control needs to be exerted because water floods in through the gills continuously. So the, the kidneys in fresh water fish work extremely fast and extremely hard to pump out water that is, that is flooding in. So there's two different, you see that there's these two completely different strategies. Uh, whether you're in fresh water or whether you're in salt water. Now, what about land animals? <clears throat> well, land animals have the, the rather similar to marine systems. They run the risk of losing water continuously. And again, one of the major areas of loss is through the respiratory surfaces, which are moist, which have to be moist in order to dissolve oxygen. Um, and as a result, the respiratory surfaces are areas where there's a major loss of water by evaporation. And um, all land animals have the adaptations to reduce water loss. Um, first of all, most uh, animals, they, land animals actually have dry skin. I know. In, in mammals, we have a slightly moist skin because we use our skin to thermoregulate. But that's, when we say dry skin, just compare most terrestrial organisms, for example, to the amphibians, which actually have, uh, have a skin which is kept moist with a mucus layer so that it can be used for respiration. But all of the other land animals have to be adapted so that they limit their evaporative loss of water. Um, just think, for example, of the reptiles with the impermeable, dry, impermeable skin. And that would gives you the idea. Although terrestrial environments are harsh, they tend to be harsh environments in terms of water loss. Nonetheless, organisms have adapted to some extraordinarily demanding terrestrial environments, for example, in deserts. And um, we'll, we'll have a look, a look specifically at uh, to the two kind of terrestrial environments, our normal human environment, although humans also do live in desert environments, but we didn't evolve in desert, in, in desert environments. Let's have a look at animals which have evolved for desert environments, we'll see they have specific adaptations um, to the low water availability. Uh, have a look at this uh, one, a kangaroo rat, a gerbil. Um, first of all, remember, in a desert environment, there is not much water available at all. And desert animals tend to be adapted to this low, the, low availability of water, they have low water demands. So um, uh, believe it or not, a, a kangaroo rat uh, adapted to uh, take in as little as two milliliters of water a day and be able to survive. It's extraordinary, extraordinarily low, even for a little animal like this, a very, very low amount of water. So uh, have a look and see how they do this. Well. Part of it comes from the food here directly. They eat, they're effectively eating water in the form of their food. They may have no access to free water at all. But look at the rest of this. Where is this coming from? It says derived from metabolism. Where in our metabolism do we make water? In respiration. Remember that we take these complex molecules and we effectively burn them with oxygen to, ex to produce ATP. And what is an important byproduct of that process? Water. We usually breathe it out. When we breathe out, what the water that you are breathing out is effectively mostly derived from metabolism. 
But if you're a desert animal and you have these adaptations, you can conserve that water of metabolism. And that is what they do. Look how much they derive from here. Where they are actually burning the food that they eat and they are conserving the water that is produced from that from resp cellular respiration. In addition, desert animals are strongly adapted to conserve whatever water they have. So they, they for example, um, if you look, where, are, where is their water loss? Well, most of it is going to be evaporative loss. And that is unavoidable because they are respiring. They're going to lose water through the lungs. Respiration has to take place across a moist surface. It's unavoidable. They are, they are going to lose water across their respiratory surfaces. That's their major water loss. Look at their urine. It's not, it's only 45% uh, of their water losses from, from the urine. Just bear that in mind when we look at human beings. Feces, um, it's uh, a relatively sm uh, small amount. They tend to produce small, very, very dry feces. Their um, bowel is adapted to suck up, as, to recover as much water as possible before, from the feces before they are voided. So let's have a look at human beings. Well, look at our water demands. Of course, we're much bigger, but nonetheless, our water demands are enormous compared to those of a desert animal. 2,500, 2.5 liters of water a day, minimum. <clears throat> Many people would advise you to drink more than that. <clears throat> um, we get a substantial amount in our food. Um, Poor kangaroo rats, in actual fact, uh, they are limited because they're in a desert environment. Most of the food they eat is really dry. We don't, we get a substantial amount of our water is satisfied by the food that we ate. Think of eating an apple or something like that. What are you doing? You eat mostly eating water, right? Um, we do conserve a small amount from our metabolism, but it's a relatively small amount compared to a desert animal, which is adapted to do so. And then we have abundant resources to provide us with free water. And most of our water that we take in is in the form of free water. Please don't tell me um, that uh, you buy your water in plastic bottles, which then pollute the environment. That is not a, an adaptation to terrestrial living. Um, so we drink most of our water. Of the 2.5 liters, we drink at least 1.5 liters as free water. What, how do we conserve? Well, we're not, we don't conserve very well at all. Um, we are not strongly adapted, metabolically adapted for living in a desert, for example. Human beings can live in a desert, but what they do then is they adapt their behavior, not their physiology. They adapt their behavior to allow them to live in, in the desert. So this, these figures here will be much the same for somebody living in a desert as living in the tropics. Um, we do lose um, quite a substantial amount of water in the feces. Nonetheless, our gut is designed to absorb water from the feces before they are avoided. We lose a, a substantial amount from evaporation across the lungs. Um, that, that is true. That, again, that is unavoidable. But look at the urine. We produce a large amount of urine, 1.5 liters a day at least. Um, and the, our urine is dilute. The urine of a desert animal is highly concentrated. With, our urine is dilute and it represents the major water loss for us. Okay, so this is just a summary. Just, uh, um, just remember something, a marine, um, uh, oh, sorry, a freshwater fish will void as much water as possible via whatever means. If you look at the urine, 
abundant urine. It's very di extremely dilute. Um, marine fish conserve water as much as possible, and they extract the water from the water, seawater that they drink continuously. Their urine is concentrated um, as much as possible. They, they produce a small amount of urine as possible that is highly concentrated. We're kind of in the middle. We produce a, a, a moderate amount of urine, but it's the, our urine is really dilute compared, for instance, to a desert animal. Okay, so that was, we, we've got this idea now. We've got to manipulate our fluids and our solutes to maintain osmolarity um, to, and to maintain that homeostatic environment. Um, but at the same time, we have to be using whatever we void to carry away waste products. And it is unavoidable that we have to lose a certain amount of water continuously because that is how we dissolve excretory products and void them from the body. So the excretory products that are of particular interest are those which result from the metabolism of proteins and nucleic acids. And the reason for that is that these are very high in nitrogen. And nitrogenous byproducts tend to be rather toxic. And the, is what is particularly important is this group here. These are minor groups, where especially when we look at relatively small molecules that result from metabolism of proteins and nucleic acids. These, um, these uh, substances with amino groups tend to be rather toxic and need to be avoided from the body. So um, a lot depends on how much water you have available as to what an organism will produce as its excretory product. What excretory product is produced is an adaptation. What I mean by that, we, can, we accept. We've all got to get rid of these, these are minor groups. Uh, if you have abundant water available, for example, in aquatic animals, they can produce this, which is ammonia, NH3, dissolved in water. The problem with this is you need a huge amount of, it's very, very soluble, and you need a huge amount of water to get rid of it all. But that is fine. If you're in an aquatic environment, um, you, you can afford to do that, even if, even if you're in a, a marine environment, although we'll hear about some of the marine environments in a minute. This is especially true of things like freshwater fish, which are avoiding water the whole time anyway. It doesn't matter to them. They can use water to dissolve the ammonia and get rid of it. We would have enormous difficulty doing that. We can't afford to lose that much water. We don't, although we do produce relatively large amounts of urine, human beings, I mean, um, we would not be able to, we won't, would not be able to avoid all the ammonia that we would produce if that was our only excretory product. Most mammals, uh, most, in fact, most terrestrial organisms, um, the amphibians, for example, sharks uh, in marine environments, and some bony fishes as well, especially marine ones, produce urea. This is our excretory product. It's a relatively small molecule, but look, it carries away two of these amino groups on each molecule of urea. So uh, th that is our uh, excretion product. It is, um, it is soluble, but it is not as highly soluble as, uh, as, um, the, as ammonia. In addition, it's not nearly as toxic as ammonia is. It's a relatively benign molecule. You don't want, uh, we don't do well with lots of urea circulating in our bodies, but it is relatively non-toxic. Um, so the, 
other you know, they're, they're, both of these they dissolve both of these situations we're dissolving the excretory product there's one other way to do it and this is to produce a, su a substance which is completely or almost completely insoluble and to produce your nitrogenous waste as a solid crystal and uh, this is a strategy which is adopted by reptiles and especially the birds. Remember how closely related the birds are to the reptiles. Many insects uh, do this. Um, uh, most, yeah, all insects do this, sorry. And many mollusks that live on land will do it as well. And it's a, a way of conserving water as well. Because what these organisms do is they excrete the nitrogenous waste as uric acid and it uh, emerges as a solid, as a sort of a paste. And uh, this is uric acid here. I'll have one more word to say about it in a, in a second. Um, if you look at bird poop, the white portion of bird poop, that is actually uric acid. It's excreted in a very, very small amount of water. Uh, just, and the water is really just to mobilize it. It's not to dissolve it, it's to mobilize it, make it like a paste that can be pooped out. Uh, it's the same if you've ever kept reptiles, you know, that it looks uh, pretty much the same. Um, I'll just go back here and tell you, um, we do produce, where well, most of our excretory product is urea, but we do produce a small amount of ammonia, which has to be dealt with by the kidneys, as we'll hear when we discuss kidney function. We also produce a small amount, usually, produce a small amount of uric acid. But sometimes our metabolism goes a bit wonky. It depends on your genetics. And um, uh, there are some people produce a higher amount of uric acid than is normal. Uric acid is almost completely insoluble. And unfortunately, when human beings do this, it tends to precipitate out in very inconvenient locations. For example, uh, people produce uh, uric acid crystals in their kidneys and get developed kidney stones. Um, but the most famous disease of all pr pr produced like this is when crystals of uric acid precipitate out in the hands, the feet, in the joints. And this is the condition of gout. Extremely, extremely painful condition due to the accumulation of uric acid. So remember, we do produce small amounts of ammonia, small amounts of uric acid, but urea is our predominant excretory product. Okay, so we're going to start talking about now how organisms actually selectively filter stuff. How is it that they are able um, in the, dealing with their body fluids to sort out what solutes they want to keep, which are useful to them, and yet excrete other things, which are waste products and largely byproducts of nitrogenous metabolism? Well, the, the answer is that in most organisms, there is some sort of a filtration product process. Um, the body fluids get processed to produce a filtrate. And that is done by its filtration because it actually is a filtering process as, we, as we'll see. The fluid that is produced is then processed. And as far as possible, um, useful products are reabsorbed from the, uh, that. In addition, uh, especially in, as we go to higher organisms, we find that they can actively secrete substances, not only waste products like urea, but toxic substances, for instance, drugs or toxins that have been taken in and inadvertently can be secreted into this fluid and that fluid it can then be voided um, the if you think about this you'll realize 
these are all the functions in, in us, in human beings. These are all the functions of the kidney. And we're going to see all of these, how exactly how they work. This is what our kidneys do. They, first of all, they filter our body fluids. They, what they filter out largely are the, are the blood corpuscles and they pass a clear fluid into the start of the filtration process. Immediately, the body resorbs a nutrients, glucose, etc., 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 and be, and uh, begin leaves in in the filtrate leaves the nitrogenous products like urea. So they selectively take up what is needed, and they leave alone what needs to be voided. At the same time, the kidney in us, the kidney tubules can secrete things like um, toxins or whatever uh, is circulating in the blood circulatory system. So they can secrete into the urine what needs to be voided. Then it's processed, this whole, all of this fluid in us is processed in order to extract as much water as possible, because this is a, this is a major water conserving area, is the kidney. So we absorb as much water as we can, and then the rest is voided in us, voided as urine. So just in very, in very simple terms, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see the blood processed in such a way that it produces a filtrate. So immediately, what have we got? We have a blood circulatory system here. It is enters a capillary, a special, specialized capillary bed. All of this is under arterial pressure. And that arterial pressure causes fluid to leak out of this capillary bed, and that is the filtrate. So what we're keeping, we're keeping in the blood circulatory system, the blood corpuscles and enough fluid to keep them moving. In the filtrate, it goes all of our waste products, in, in our case, urea, but also along with it goes useful stuff, nutrients, glucose, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to get that back. So this is the, the tubule and we're going to resorb what is useful, glucose, nutrients, vitamins, what, what, whatever, whatever we need, we will resorb. It gives the kidney an opportunity as well to secrete toxins other things that it needs to get rid of. And those are passed into the urine. All the way along the line, we absorb as much water as we can, still leaving the, the urine functional so that it can be excreted together with waste products and everything else. That is our system at its simplest. It's a little, obviously a little bit more complicated than that but this is a good diagram to keep in mind, uh, especially for your revision. Okay, what I've left out of this discussion is um, a discussion about how these systems, uh, basically the same kind of system, um, appears in many, many different organisms. And if we look from the simplest, simpler organisms, at their filtration systems, we can see it, an evolutionary trend as they become more and more and more elaborate. And um, so this is an extra credit opportunity for you. I'm not going to discuss it in great detail, um, but I'm asking you to uh, please compare. It's clearly uh, detailed in your textbook. Um, I want you to compare these, they're called the proto-nephridia, obvious proto, very early, meta-nephridia, that's kind of middling there, and they are, they are uh, typical of, of things like uh, the annelids, that sort of thing, and then malpigian tubules. And um, uh, compare those, 1.5% extra credit, um, I haven't put a date on here, but uh, let's let's make it two weeks. So, and I'll I'll post a reminder uh, on Canvas if I remember. I'll post a reminder. I'm making a note now. 
Um, okay. And that will give you a good idea. If you're interested, it will give you a good idea about the evolution of, of, of the human kidney. Okay, so here's our human kidney. This is a, an amazing, amazing, amazing organ. Um, it's silly to say that one organ is more important than, than another, but um, the, the kidney is, is important because it performs so many different functions. It is true that um, its major responsibility is to excrete nitrogenous waste and to do so efficiently with as a minimal loss of water, but enough water to efficiently dissolve the urea and then the small amount of ammonia that we, that, that we do produce as well. So that's its, we'd say that's its primary responsibility. However, the kidney is involved in the homeostasis of the entire organism as well. And the kidney is responsible, for example, for maintaining the pH of the blood. It's hugely, hugely important. It's re responsible for maintaining solute concentrations of the blood, which are critically important. If that goes out of, uh, out of homeostasis, it is, can be a fatal situation if our solute concentrations go wildly wrong. The third thing, um, the kidneys are responsible for doing things like maintaining blood pressure. They actually interact with the heart, for example. Um, they interact with blood vessels in maintaining blood pressure. So the kidneys are performing a huge range of functions. But all of them, in fact, it comes down to it is the selective ability to deal with solutes, to pump in, take out solutes. And I forgot to add that kidneys are also responsible to a large degree with detoxifying the blood system of uh, toxins and things like that. Believe it or not, we take in toxins the whole time. We take in small amounts of toxin, for example, in our food constantly. Um, uh, many plants, for example, have toxic substances, um, but they're in small concentration, never, would never, never affect us, thanks to our kidneys. Uh, our kidneys are able to selectively take those toxins and uh, excrete them. So there's a huge range of, of functions that a kidney actually has. You don't need to worry about all of the details here. I just want to point out this is the major structure of the kidney. Of course, we have two um, kidneys, one on each side, um, and uh, they have huge vessels which flow into them. They require an enormous blood supply. And um, so blood is supplied in the renal artery um, and leaves the kidney um, the re in the renal vein. So um, the arteries come in, uh, they divide and divide and divide into these small arterioles. And up here in this region here, um, they form, oh, here's one here, um, they will form a little knot of arterial capillaries. And that is where the blood pressure is so great that they begin to leak fluid. And that fluid is the filtrate that is going to be processed. So most of the, those knots of, of um, arterioles are up here. A single unit, filtration unit, is called a nephron. So the filtration is done up there, and then all of the tubules that process are down here. You can see that they're organized into these bodies called the pyramids there. And um, these filtration tubules end up, they, the end of the nephron is called the collecting duct. And it's down the collecting duct that the processed urine flows. Collecting ducts all start to join together, form bigger and bigger vessels um, until they form these great vessels here that all join together to form the ureter. And the ureter 
flows to the bladder where the urine is stored. No further processing takes place. Um, so this is a filtration unit organized into these pyramids here. There are a gazillion of them, very small, very fine, all leading down to these collecting tubules and out. The blood, meanwhile, after it's been through the whole processing, is as usual, is gathered together in the renal veins and then uh, makes its way to the heart. So the blood coming in here, first of all, we'll just think. Blood coming in here, what does it carry with it? It carries byproducts of metabolism. Urea, principally, um, a small amount of ammonia, and also all sorts of useful things. Nutrients, glucose, all of that sort of thing. So it is a responsibility of the kidney, first of all, to reabsorb the useful products and send that out back out to the body. But at the same time to pull out in, and dump into the urine, urea, toxins, all of that sort of thing. And that is what flows out um, in the urine. Um, the outer part here is called the renal cortex. The inner part here is called the medulla. And this, all that uh, I need you to remember, um, just call this the renal pelvis there. This area here where the, at this funnel shaped um, entrance to the ureter. You'll see it's called, uh, just use that name there. Don't worry about all of the other stuff here. Just the renal pelvis is fine. That's all you need to remember. Cortex, medulla, pyramids, renal pelvis, ureter, the renal artery, and the renal vein. That's as much as I need you to know about the anatomy of the kidney. Okay. Um, this is to basically tells you this, the same thing. It shows you here. I don't worry about the different positioning of, of the nephrons, it's fine. Just remember that most of the filtration takes place up here in the renal cortex, and then most of the processing takes place in the renal medulla, and in the renal medulla is also where all of the collecting ducts run through and eventually all join together in the renal pelvis. And um, let's leave it there for today, and we'll talk about uh, kidney function uh, next time. And um, uh, remember the little, little bit of extra credit, and I'll try and remember to put up a reminder about that. Okay, um, if there are any questions, now's the time. No questions, thank you. Go ahead. Have a nice day. Okay, all right then, thanks.